All right, welcome everybody. It's just after 12 o'clock. My name is Benji Cohen with Minnesota DNR Fish and Wildlife Outreach Section. Got an exciting program today with Chris Meyer from our Orton, Ortonville area fisheries talking about freshwater drum. So Chris, I'm gonna pass it over to you. All right, thank you. Um, yeah, my name is Chris Domeyer. I'm the fishery supervisor out here in Ortonville, the western side of the state. I grew up uh, actually by New Ulm, Minnesota, southern Minnesota. Grew up on a, a small diversified family farm down there. We were lucky. We had a pond in our yard and I grew up fishing bullheads and I've been interested in fish and fishing since I was a you know, very young person and I've been lucky enough to work for DNR Fisheries now for almost 34 years. So. So I'm going to tell you what I know about fish and drum. On um, this slide, right away, you can see that is a little freshwater drum in my hands. It's only a couple inches long, and that's what a, a young, uh, about one to two month old little drum actually looks like. So it's a real close up picture of uh, just a young of the year fish. Of course, now it doesn't want to go down. <laughs> Okay, I'm locked up right now. There we go. It just took a little while to catch up. I'm going to run over um, several things today, a little bit about biology, then I'm going to move on to uh, where you, you can fish drum, how to fish drum, and then I'm going to finish up with uh, a little bit on cleaning and cooking drum. Yeah, it's lagging again for me here for some well, there we go. I can use my mouse to move it, so I'm going to have to do that. Drums are in a family of fish that's called cyanidae. It's just a fancy name, a way of grouping fish that look a lot alike together. There's more than 100 species of, of drum in the world. But there's only one truly freshwater species, and that's the, the fish we call the freshwater drum. Makes sense. Uh, drum are also known by a bunch of different names from croakers to gasper goo to bubbler grunts and sheep's head. The name that's probably most common in this part of the world is sheep's head. And I, I think when you talk to anyone in the Midwest, most people know what a sheep's head fish is. Uh, one unique thing about freshwater drum is they have very large ear stones in their head. And these things are big enough. They're, some of them are like the size of a quarter and people like to use them at times for jewelry or they even use them as lucky stones. This is an illustration of a freshwater drum. Uh, a few things I'm gonna point out on this fish is, is starting at the mouth. They don't have uh, any big teeth. They have a lot of little teeth in that mouth, but they don't have the big typical uh, sharp teeth that you would expect in a predator fish. They have a kind of a rounded head and that's where the sheep, sheep's head name comes from. Uh, it looks kind of like a ram's head. So that's where the nickname came from for sheep's head. They have a long dorsal fin with some spines in the front end of it. You can see those here. They have a rounded tail. And they also have some spines in their bottom fins, and you can see those in this, this illustration. They're sharp and they're pointy. And drum can vary in color from gold to silver, and uh, the golder ones tend to be in clearer water, and the, the more silver ones tend to be in, in uh, a more turbid or dirtier water. This is an example of an ocean drum. This is a black drum, and I put this up just to give you an idea of, of how similar these fish look. And you can also then understand why they're put into the same family of fishes. So this is a pretty good sized black drum, probably 10 to 15 pounds. This is an image of a freshwater drum, and this is a fish that was caught in Michigan. It's a pretty good sized one, probably in that 10 pound category. Uh, this fish is pretty gold. It came from pretty clear water. Uh, the world record freshwater drum came from Tennessee and it's about 55 pounds. And then the Minnesota record freshwater drum came from down by Winona and the Minnesota, or not the Minnesota, the Mississippi River. And it was about 35 pounds. In general, if you're going to catch drum in southern Minnesota, northwest Minnesota, you're, most of them are going to be one to five pounds, but you can certainly get fish that are, you know, up above 10 pounds. Drum can lay a lot of eggs. A single female can produce 50 to 500,000 eggs. That's a pretty good number. Um, the uh, fish actually broadcast spawn these eggs in the spring out at the water's surface. So they're not really in along shore as much as out in the open water more. 
the males and females will spawn together at the uh, surface of the water. An interesting thing about the males is they will actually croak, and that's where the name croaker comes from. And if you look, or if you're sitting in the boat and it's quiet enough, you can actually hear them in the water. I've, I've fished uh, on lakes in the spring many times where you can hear the, the uh, male sheep's heads that actually out there making that noise. So it's kind of neat. The eggs in the larva will float at the surface of the water, which is not common for freshwater fish, but it is very common for saltwater fish. So similar to their saltwater cousins, their, their eggs and larvae float. They hatch really quick, only one to two days for these eggs to hatch and turn into the small little larvae drum. That's fast. Um, in comparison, walleye eggs probably take 10 to 15 days to hatch. And then once these uh, eggs hatch, the little drum are, are left to fend for themselves and there's no parental care provided by, by the parents. So when you have a lot of eggs um, and a lot of spawn, you end up with a lot of little drum. This is a picture of a seine pole on Lacaparo Lake and almost all the silverfish in here are little freshwater drum. They're about two months old. They're three, maybe four inches long. Uh, you can see a few other species mixed in, but most of these fish are, are indeed those little freshwater drum. And they're really silver because these fish are coming out of pretty turbid or pretty turbid or pretty dirty water. And therefore they have that really shiny silvery color to them. When you have a lot of little drum in the lake, you can end up with a lot of big drum. This is an interesting slide. Um, I don't want to confuse people, but this is adult freshwater drum that came from one seine pool under the ice on Big Stone Lake during the winter. And this was only half of them. So this is a pretty small area of the lake that the commercial fishermen seined and they caught this many drum. A drum can be used or kept as a commercial fish species. And in this case, these fish, um, I think most of them ended up being processed into crab food. It's pretty rare that the sea commercial um, fishermen target drum. They usually catch them kind of as a side catch. So this is, I would say, uncommon, um, but it does happen, you know, at times. The, the real message here, though, is there can be a lot of drum in a lake. So if you're interested in fishing drum and these kind of numbers are out there, you can have some really good fishing for them. Drum, uh, what do they eat? They eat just about anything they can fit in their mouth. Now, I mentioned that they have little teeth in their mouth, but just because they have little teeth doesn't mean they won't eat just about anything, including fish. Um, they'll eat insects. The top left here, I have a mayfly larva. This is uh, what what you would see when they leave the lake, they'll come out, they'll have the little yellow wings on them, they'll be around gas stations in May and June a lot of times and get on your cars. So that's the, the aquatic form. They live in the bottom of the lake in the, in the sediment. Uh, they'll pick those out. Drum will eat crayfish in the top right. They'll eat snails. I've got a snail on the bottom left and they'll eat, like I said, they'll eat fish. They'll eat any kind of fish basically they can fit in their mouth. This is an image of a bunch of little Northern pike they're only about a month old. Normally you would think pike are going to be eating drum, but, but drum will also eat pike if they can catch them and if they're small enough. Drum will also eat a lot of mussels or, or clams. Um, they have special teeth in their throat that allows them to crush the clam shells and then they eat the soft parts and they spit the uh, shells back out. This is a selection of, of native mussels on the left. And there's probably five species here. As long as they can fit them in their mouth yeah, easily, they'll they'll eat them and crush them and spit them out. And then on the right, I have the invasive zebra mussels, and they'll also eat zebra mussels and, and again, crush the shells and spit the shells out, but eat the soft parts. And in the fish world, it's, it's often eat or be eaten. So drum will eat fish, but drum are also a really important forage for a lot of our predator fish. This walleye is only about 14 inches long and it's got four um, young of the year drum inside of it. Three you can see pretty easily and one's been, uh, you know, mostly digested at this point. So, so drum will eat little walleyes too or, or little, just about any kind of fish that they can get in their mouth. So it, it goes both ways. Uh, one thing I like to joke about with this slide always is this is the reason walleyes taste so good is because they're eating little freshwater drum. Where do you find drum in Minnesota? Well, basically anywhere inside of the red border. 
So they go from Canada down to Iowa and South Dakota over to Wisconsin. You will not find them, however, in the upper Mississippi drainage, including Mille Lacs and the Leech Lake uh, area, or up in the Arrowhead. But they are located through, throughout the uh, rest of the state. So if you want to know the details on the best places to fish drum, get a hold of us. Just contact your local DNR fisheries people at their area offices. And I'm going to show you how to do that real quick. You go to the DNR um, homepage, webpage on the internet. In the top right, I've highlighted it in red. Click on the About DNR. And that's going to take you to an office locator page. Now, on the office locator page, choose fisheries, and that's gonna give you a map with all the area fisheries offices. So this is where the field staff are that are doing the actual fish surveys on lakes and rivers. And then you can click on any of those icons. In this case, I've highlighted Ortonville's um, location, circled it in red. So you would click on that icon. And when you do that, it's gonna take you to our area fisheries landing page, basically. And here it will tell you where to find us at the physical address, give you uh, our phone number. It's going to also give you our email address and it'll also give you all the staff people at this office and their um, email addresses also. So you can specifically email any of us that, that you would like or call us or stop by. Any of these things work. And this is available, like I said, for all those area offices that are on that map. I did a little uh, work beforehand for everybody. So the fishing hotspots right now for drum in Minnesota, I did to list all the offices that have drum and these th this is the list I, I received we have lake st croix the mississippi river downstream of st anthony falls the minnesota river and almost all of its tributaries have drum madison and washington lakes east of mankato the fairmont channel lakes uh, fox lake near sherburn norway foot and wilmer lakes near wilmer the red river and red lake river in northwest minnesota and then here in our area big stone lake Parl, and traverse lakes um, these, you know, all these spots are, are pretty much located through that entire zone that I had circled in red. So you can find a place to fish, hopefully relatively close to home if you, if you live somewhere within that red zone. If you want more detailed information, I'm going to run you through how to find our actual fish data on the internet. Again, you go to the DNR webpage, and on the webpage, go to the left side this time and look for Lake Finder. And here I again circled it or highlighted it in red. Click on Lake Finder. You'll get this page here, and now you can either go up to the top left and type the lake name in you're interested in specifically, or you can use this red circle little drop down and choose a county. In this case, I'm going to choose, I did that and I chose Big Stone County and then choose Get Lake Data. So click on that. And it's going to give you all the lakes in Big Stone County on the next page. At this point, you can choose whichever one you want to see specific information for. In this case, I'm just going to choose Artichoke, the first one. So I boxed that in red so you can see it easily. I made a choice, click on Artichoke. And it's going to give you the landing page for Artichoke Lake. And here you can find all kinds of information about a lake. You look at the left side and there's multiple choices you can choose to, to get information. But the one you want, if you want the fish data in that lake from the most recent survey done by the area staff is this fisheries lake survey. So click on that. I highlighted it in red here. And it's going to bring you to the page that has the actual fish data on it. Now on this page, there's multiple years of data available usually. You would go to this little highlighted circle I hear on the drop down arrow, click that, and then you can get the most recent data. And this lake, the most recent data was 2021. So I, so I chose that and I clicked that, and it's gonna keep you on the same page, but it's gonna then load the most recent data for Artichoke Lake. And what you're gonna get is the actual net catches of those fish in the lake. And here we want to look at freshwater drum. So we scroll down to freshwater drum. You're going to see four choices. They're different gear types. The best gear for sampling drum is gill nets. So I highlighted that, that gear type here. So I'm looking at freshwater drum and gill nets. And then the catch per unit effort, the CPUE, is the number of drum per net. So we had 12 drum per gill net. And then the normal range for lakes like Artichoke Lake is anywhere from four to 24. So this data tells you there's a 
decent number of drum in the lake at 12 per net, and it's it's within the normal range. It's not super high, but it's a it's a decent catch. So so now you know there's drum there and halfway decent numbers. The second part of the story is you want to scroll down on this page a little further, and you're going to see all the lengths of the fish. So here we have a, a length frequency on the top in, in categories of inches. And you go down to drum, and when you look at drum, you're going to see there were 22 drum that were 8 to 9 inches, and 23 that were 15 to 19. Most of those drum were in those two categories. But now you have to think ahead. This was 2021. So in 2023, they had at least one more summer of growth, so they're going to be bigger. So keep that in mind. You've, got, you've always got to think back to when was that data collected. And the last piece of advice I have when using Lake Finder and looking at actual surveys is things can change unexpectedly. Um, this year we had a severe winter kill in Artichoke Lake that just happened. So there's probably going to be very few drum left to catch in the lake the way it looks right now. So again, I'd recommend going back to that area office and before you make your trip, Give them a quick call or an email and say, hey, is this still pretty accurate? And would this be a good place to go, go fish for drum or any other species that you use this information for? Uh, when it comes to fishing drum, you can fish them from shore. You can fish them from a boat. Here we're out fishing in a boat. In this case, we're on the river. I generally fish five to 10 feet deep, but our deepest lake out is for the most part, only 15 feet, but generally you're going to find drum in five to 10 feet of water in the summer. Uh, current areas or around rocky reefs are good spots. Here we're in the current. You can kind of tell that by looking at the current next to the boat. And if you look closer, you can actually see uh, what, what this gentleman was using. He had a uh, lime green paddle, paddle tail jig on that he caught this fish on. This is a pretty big drum for out here. This one was getting close to 10 pounds, I would say. So that was a pretty nice fish. You can have some really good fishing for drum in a, in a lot of the rivers, especially the Minnesota River. Shore fishing for drum will work just as well in, in lakes that have good populations or rivers. Um, this is just an example of a fishing pier out here on one of our kids' ponds. You can find locations of our fishing piers again by going to the Minnesota DNR website and uh, search for the for the pier locations, and you can find a map that will provide you a lot of um, a lot of ideas where you can go fish from shore on fishing piers. Another spot that I I uh, really like to fish for drum from is from bridge crossings that have sidewalks or fishing walks going across them. This is the outlet of Big Stone Lake where the Minnesota River comes out of the lake. These work really well because you can some, sometimes sit down on a lawn chair or lean on the railing, uh, cast a, a jig or a, a weighted you know, lure out with, with some bait on it and just sit back and relax. And the current is usually strong enough to keep your line tight. And when you do have a fish bite, you can actually uh, see your rod start to uh, vibrate out there. So these are really good fishing locations um, throughout uh, throughout drum, drum uh, habitat. When it comes to fishing gear, you don't need anything fancy. These are three of my rods and reels. I would call them pretty average, small to average size fishing reels, six, seven foot rods, um, five to 10 pound test. You don't you don't need anything out of the ordinary to fish for drum. If you want to catch a really big one, I would still say this would be adequate gear as long as you have a good drag uh, system on your reel. One of the uh, best ways to fish them if you're in relatively still water is to use a uh, slip bobber rig here, a slip bobber, bobber, bobber with a weight on it and a circle hook. Pass this out. You want to bait it with worms or leeches. Have that hook anywhere from maybe six inches to a foot off the bottom. And if you're in a habitat that's holding drum, this will work really well for, for catching them. Another really good lure to use that I mentioned before is, is jigs. Um, you can tell by the quarter in this image, these jigs are only a couple inches long. You don't need very big ones. Uh, typically, I cast them out and reel them in with a, a steady retrieve, or you can cast them out and literally jig them up and down as you bring them in. Usually, the drum will hit the jig as it drops down. These work really well off those bridge crossings. I usually take the rubber bodies off and just put a piece of uh, micro or a leech on them and get the weight just right so it sits on the bottom and you can kind of bounce it off the bottom. 
so you can keep your lure in the water full time. And um, the highest catch rates I've ever had with drum come from fishing in, in that fashion with jigs. Another thing that can, can maybe be somewhat surprising to people is plugs work really well also. Um, these plugs aren't very big, a couple inches again. Uh, drum will hit plugs as hard as any game fish when you're trolling, whether it's in a lake or the river. Um, it's actually pretty impressive how hard drum will bite a, a plug. Again, they don't have big teeth in their mouth, but they have a lot of little teeth, but it doesn't seem to matter. They're a very aggressive predator when the, uh, when the opportunity to bite a plug comes by them. I generally catch more drum trolling plugs in the fall than I actually uh, catch walleyes. I want to put a little plug in for using uh, our lead, uh, the lead free tackle that's out there now. You can see here there's uh, weights in there and jigs. This stuff works and it works well. Um, it's, uh, it's good now to start considering and moving away from all the lead tackle that's been accumulating out in the environment and moving to these new choices we have available. One of the best things about fishing drum is there's a continuous season on them. You can be out fishing drum year round, which is nice. Um, a lot of times before the walleye season op opens up, we'll be fishing drum out here on the bridges and you can have some really good fishing for them. Uh, they don't bite well in cold water. You're not likely to catch them in the winter or when the water's probably below 50 degrees in the spring and the fall. But uh, once the water starts warming in the spring, they can provide some really good fishing already in April. So, so it's a nice species to get you out early and it's a great species to fish with kids because they do bite so well. This drum was caught on Artichoke Lake and uh, this young man, I think, had a, had a pretty good time out there fishing for them. And another thing that's really nice about drum is there is no limit on them. Um, the use on them right at this point, we have no concerns about over harvest because the harvest isn't that high. They're a tremendous fish to use for fish fries. Um, you can go out and catch 30 of these and have a nice family fish fry and you don't have to worry about how many can I have in my refrigerator or freezer and being over the limit. You can legally keep enough freshwater drum to have a really nice large family fish fry. When it comes to cleaning drum, I have to apologize a little bit. I was trying to get a, a, a new drum picture for this and I couldn't catch one. So that's the that's the irony of my talk. I couldn't catch a drum in the last two weeks, but it was just too darn cold. But this is a fillet drum and the, they're easy to fillet. You cut behind the uh, gilt cover and you follow the backbone. The backbone is very strong. It's very easy to stay next to it with a knife and the rib cage is very strong and you go around the rib cage. They have no secondary rib bones or anything. So when you fillet that fillet off, it's bone free. And th there's a couple secrets to this. And, and one is when you flip the skin over, you want to use light knife pressure to take that meat off the fillet, off the skin. And that fillet that's laying above this fish was on that piece of skin that looks like it still has some meat on it and it does. And, and there's a reason for that. You want to leave that red meat behind. That's what will give drum an off flavor and that's what's given them a bad reputation over the years is you need to get rid of the red meat. Once you do that, that bad flavor will be gone. And the other thing you want to be really careful of is don't get the slime of drum on the fillet because drum have a very strong odor to them. And it's not in the meat, but it will be if you get the fish slime onto the fillet when you're cleaning them. So use some extra care to keep those, those fillets as clean as you can. And that fillet that's laying up there right now, you can still see some really dark red meat on the tail section. So it's laying um, the same direction as the, the skin below, but I flipped it over. You want to trim that out also with your knife. So any red meat that's left on the fillet, uh, put it on a, a clean, cleaner board where you have no slime and then carefully thin slice the rest of that red meat away from that fillet. Now that's critical, those two steps, get rid of the red meat, and don't get any slime on it. And then you're gonna have a very nice piece of fish. And this is a, an example of those fillets in a, uh, this is in a plastic Tupperware tub with water in them. So they're a little hard to see, but you can see nonetheless that this is a pretty, pretty clean fillet. And it also has a very nice muscle structure. This is a nice firm piece of meat. So it's a very nice fish to cook when you cook fish. And I could tell you more, but there's way, way better information available on the internet. So go into your search engine, type in freshwater drum recipes, and you'll find a YouTube video on how to clean them. You'll find all kinds of 
information on how to cook them. Type in, type in drum recipes, you'll get ocean drum recipes, you name it. Type in fish recipes. It doesn't matter how you cook them. They're fish. Use any fish recipe in any way you want to cook fish. Try different things and find what you like. You can deep fry them, you can pan fry them, you can bake them, you can broil them. Everything will work for you. So just find something you like and, and uh, when you do, that's you know what I would recommend how, how to cook them. The very first time I cooked drum, I actually fried them in a frying pan. Um, and I fried them like this. This this isn't my work. I'm not this good. But but this is what they looked like. They were nice firm fillets. I didn't put anything on them on purpose. I just fried them in a real little bit of uh, olive oil. And then what I did is I got them nice and crispy brown on both sides. And then I sprinkled a little turmeric or curry. I think I used curry powder at that time on top of them. And I slid them in front of my wife and said, give this a try. And she's eaten a lot of fish and she, it has to taste good is the bottom line. And she said it was the best piece of fish she ever had. So, so they, when they're cared for properly and cooked properly, they, they can be very, very good. The last thing I'm gonna mention is this gentleman here, his name is Del Wearspan, and he's the one that first cooked drum for me. And I, perspective is everything. I was extremely apprehensive. I was already fretting the first bite. Um, this was probably 20 years ago, almost now. And my perspective was these things aren't gonna taste good. Nobody eats them. Well, um, the way he cleaned them and cooked them, they were excellent. He had multiple people at this fish fry and all the fish was eaten. And in the end, he told me these are our Minnesota River sunfish. And, and what he meant by that was he's cleaning the smaller ones around 10 inches. They, they have a fillet that looks like a sunfish. They clean a lot like a sunfish and they taste a lot like a sunfish. They taste good. So I have to, to thank this gentleman for making a believer out of me. Otherwise, I, I still may, may have my doubts, but um, it, was, uh, it was a very eye-opening uh, uh, occasion, I would say. And it was, you're never too old to learn new things is what I, what I learned from Dell. And that's uh, all I have. Thanks, Chris. Great presentation. It's one of those, we've done a few of these. We did uh, burbot and some, we've done a episode on rough fish. If you look back in some of the programs we've done and there's these great fish that are all over the state of Minnesota in different areas that you can fish for year round. Uh, some of them are great eating too. And I know I've heard a lot of good things about burbot and drum. I was trying to remember the last time I actually tried drum, I think it was when my grandpa was around and it's been long enough that I can't rem really remember what it tasted like. So I got a new species I got to put on the list and, and try this summer. So um, I'm going to open a couple of poll questions. We got just three short questions today I threw in there. So if anybody wants to jump in and answer those, please do that. It's always fun. So we got a few questions coming in. Uh, Mary has a two part question. How long do drum live? I'll let you do that one first, I guess. Oh boy. Um, from what I remember, some of those Red Lake fish, I think were like 80 years old based on old lith aging, which is precise um, or it's accurate. So they can live to be very old. Down here, I don't know if we've ever aged one to be honest, but I would guess some of those fish that are in that 20 pound range have to be you know, 30, 40 years old, I would I would bet. But that Red Lake information was pretty amazing. I remember when they were working on that, that was probably 25 years ago now that they did some of that aging. Wow, that's interesting. I don't think of fish living that long all the time. And yeah, it's, it's pretty special. Um, and about the odorless, she was asking, and are the odorless used by climate scientists or others for climate water chemistry records? I have no idea. <laughs> The, um, they kind of grow like like rings on a tree, right? So you can kind of, the odolith, you can actually count yeah. the rings in there. You can definitely see faster growing years and things like that, but I don't yeah, I don't know if it, they've been used for anything like that. Hmm. Interesting. Somebody Mary might be onto something, we don't know. Someone may hold the secret to climate change in a necklace they're wearing right now. There you go. So. Our friend Maverick's back today. He was he wanted to share 
uh, his best way of catching drum on upper red lake he likes using red and gold spinner bait or just plain gold jigs baited with a shiner minnow head so yeah and i i would i guess my summary for catching drum anything you do for walleyes is going to work for drum it's it's almost a given maybe that's what all these early boats are after out in the river these days so uh Jeff was wondering, are there any health consumption concerns with eating drum? You know, we we have tested some out here. Um, and from what I remember, I'd have to go find the actual data. I was I was looking for it. You're not the only one. I forgot about it again. But I think they tested out to be pretty similar um, to, to our other species, such as um, crappies and maybe even a little less mercury than walleyes. But there was no red flags with them. Oh, you do know. And that's, you know, finding information about consumption concerns on different species of fish. Is that listed in our Lake Finder map or where do people find that on the DNR website? Do you know off the top, top of your head? Surprise question. I think that might be on that landing page for the lake where it may have Department of Health, but it's Minnesota Department of Health that has that information. So you want to, okay. and you can find them pretty good, quick if you uh, type into the search engine, you know, Minnesota Fish Consumption Advisory. It'll it'll come up with that page for sure. Great. Hey, Craig, if you want to throw that in the chat, that be might be interesting. So uh, Sally was wondering, is winter kill information available on the Lake Finder page? No. Um, so there you want to contact the area offices. Some offices manage to get stuff up on on their, their area web page relatively quick, but the fastest information, if you want to know something before fishing opener, for example, in Southern Minnesota, call us, call the area office and say, hey, I was thinking of fishing this lake, what do you know? And we don't know everything, but some of the lakes we are sampling with nets and we'll have a pretty good answer. And Springs out there, you guys are out and busy this time of year, doing a lot of stocking and serving and everything else. So to get stuff, you know, putting stuff up on the website isn't a top priority and it takes a little time. So that yeah. call the area offices. I did put both that link and the Lake Finder link in our chat. So if you want to click on that in the chat function, go ahead and save that for for when you want. So uh, Kristen was wondering, have you noticed any difference in the flavor between clear water fish and fish that come from turbid waters? Yeah, that's a good question. I would recommend the turbid water fish, the Minnesota River. So people always think the river is really polluted, right? The, the fish in the Minnesota River are are just fine to eat the same as a lake. They can even be have less mercury in them, believe it or not. <laughs> um, the smaller fish from turbid water have been the best tasting one, ones. We've cleaned a few really big ones from Big Stone Lake, which is pretty clear, and they can get a little of that mossy flavor that you see also, though, and you can see that in the walleye. So I would say I recommend eating the fish that are around 10 to 15 inches. And it seems like the Minnesota River, Minnesota River fish are some of the best tasting ones. Interesting. I was going to guess it would be the opposite. But... Yes, everyone does. And that old adage of that river is so polluted, that's the, no. The, uh, I always tell people that the, the, the biggest pollutant to worry about is mercury. Um, when you get to other things like uh, chemicals used, you know, all over the place for, especially for herbicides, things like that on your lawns, you name it. When you spray your lawn and you're smelling 2,4-D, you're breathing in more 2,4-D than you're ever going to get eating fish your entire life. Um, so if you're, if you're worried about, you know, those kind of things, you really want to consider what you're actually getting in other sources and not eating fish. Fish, you're really looking at mercury, and then there's a couple other things. PCBs still pop up some, and now there's some concern over PFAS, but mercury is the number one. So as you um, you look at fish consumption advisories, watch those mercury advise, advisories that are on the Department of Health. That's, that's what you want to focus on. Otherwise, the water body, no. The cleaner the water body, sometimes the higher the mercury, because it doesn't get tied up into the sediments so it, it can be, like you said, just the opposite. Good to know. That's interesting. I see Craig did put that link to the fish advisory stuff in the chat too for anybody looking for that. So uh, Casey had a, a question here wondering if drum are 
eating zebra mussels, shouldn't we be doing more to keep them, keep more of them around and eating? I don't think they could eat enough. <laughs> um, <laughs> if it, if it, you know, if we have a system where where the food chain is basically zebra mussels and drum, we're in trouble. So, so we're, you know, we're hoping that these aquatic systems. Um, over time, the zebra mussels, you know, maybe go down in abundance where they are really high and we get back to more of a normal phytoplankton, zooplankton, you know, food web. We don't, I don't think drum, let me put it this way, I don't think drum would be a biological control on zebra mussels. Um, it, it would have to be a very unique system. There's way too many zebra mussels, I suppose. There's, there's a lot out there, so um, I don't, yeah, I don't see that happening, but, um, and, and the other thing with drum is there, ten, there tend to be uh, angler harvest at this point, like I said, is pretty low. So um, the number they're taking out of a population is probably replaced pretty fast by other ones growing into that niche. Interesting. Um, Jeff had a question about drum spawning. When do they spawn? And it's that's such an interesting story to me on the spawning process. Is that the only fish in Minnesota that kind of has top water spawn like that? As far as I, I know, at least of, of the, the bigger, you know, game type fishes, um, I think they're spawning mostly in May, I would say, because I've heard them um, fishing on Artichoke Lake where, where you know, first you think you're hearing things, obviously you're like, no, that's definitely fish making that croaking sound. So. It's in that, uh, I think it's probably in that May period. Um, we'll see walleye spawning in mid to late April, and then I think drum are kind of in early to mid May type of a type of a time. Interesting. Uh, Tom was wondering, have you ever tried soaking fillets in baking soda to remove any undesired flavor? I haven't tried that one, but I've tried lemon juice. I'll use lemon juice sometimes and, and things like that. And I, I think there are there are definitely different things that that will work to help take some of that. You know, you can have that mossy flavor in just about any species of fish I've ever cooked, and I think it has a lot to do with you know the, the habitat they're living in and what they're eating. So, yeah, if you have fish that you know have a mossy flavor, that might be another thing to try, but lemon juice seems to work some. You've heard of uh, putting them in the uh, cola, different things like that, so. Oh, yeah. It's interesting. I know we were talking the other day too about, there was like a, you said there was a chart, I think it was from Florida about how the quality of fish taste and stuff and drum are right up there. So I found yeah. that interesting. They put the red drum at number three out of four. Four was the best, and fours were the were like the snappers and the gay groupers. So red drum was right there below them, which is pretty good. And you said you put drum in Minnesota pretty high on that a chart like that. In, in my world, I I put yellow perch first, um, walleye second, and drum third, and I would put crappies fourth. So I definitely would put a drum above a crappie. But again, it's, it has a lot to do with how you're cooking them. Walleye and perch are really hard to beat. They're just such nice white flaky meat. But but drum are, you know, they come in pretty close behind them if they're prepared properly. Great. So I don't see any other questions in here. Thanks so much for all the information that you uh, shared today. I was going to look at the poll results here. It looks... Um, yeah, we've had quite a few, about half of our audience caught, have caught drum before. Um, do you actively fish for them? Only four out of the people that answer, only four of them actively fish for drum. So maybe we can change that a little bit today because I'm kind of, <laughs> it's a beautiful day here in Minnesota. I like to get out, chase some drum. Hopefully the water's getting warm enough and the river's going down a little bit. Uh, I'll tell you. I'll tell you a good story. It's like I said, perspective is everything. So we were up working on Lake Traverse, which has drum in them, and there was a, a, a young gentleman with a couple of kids. They were camping. They were having fun, and they were cooking fish, and he didn't know what they had caught. and And I was looking at what they had. And I thought, well, those look kind of like drum fillets. But he said, well, we threw the, uh, the you know the carcasses over in the dumpster. So I went over, and they were indeed freshwater drum. And those kids were eating them, and they were happy, and they were having this wonderful trip. So 
you know, I, I'll see people that be like, oh, it's a drum, you know, and it's, it's like perspective is everything. Teach those, at least those young people, just to have fun fishing. And then if you want to cook some fish, these will work. It's you just have to start thinking outside the box. It's we've been ingrained. Uh, we've been ingrained since we were small that certain fish are good and other ones are bad. If you want to go have fun, it's the number of fish you catch that matters. Right? Yeah. yeah. So, so just keep that perspective and go have a good time. And and uh, and I don't care what it is when I reel it in. It's just it's fun to go fishing. Yep, that's the the key to it. It's it's no fun if you're just sitting on the bank. It's always more fun if you're reeling something in. So, I don't know off the top of my head how many species of fish we have in Minnesota currently, but I know Corey is it Greving that does RoughFish.com. He did a rush rough fish talk uh, several months ago, mm-hmm. and he was I think he's trying to catch every species of catchable fish, and I think he's up to like 134 species in Minnesota. Which wow. is a ton. So if you're looking for a good challenge and want to get out there fishing, make sure you add drum to the list. So, yes. All right. I think with that, we're going to stop the recording. I want to thank everybody, uh, Chris, especially thank you for taking your time out of a busy time of the season here to share with us a passion you have about freshwater drum. And thanks for everybody for tuning in. Uh, hopefully, you can get out and enjoy the beautiful weather we have outside here. It's nice and sunny here at my place. Um, ready to take the dog for a walk. And next week we're going to talk, it's fishing opener obviously next weekend. So we're going to talk a little bit about fishing in Southern Minnesota. We got Scott McIntoon who's been on our program several times and a few other fishery staff that are going to join us to talk about uh, fishing opener and improving our success rate for fishing opener next week. So thanks everybody. See you next week.